Well, I think, Kevin, we're ready. Okay. Let's get started. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is a fantastic crowd, so we're really excited that you're all here. Uh, Left Bank Books is delighted to present uh, St. Louis raised author, documentarian, and television producer Eric Bonnestrock. <laughs> Eric will be discussing book three in the Intersecting Worlds trilogy, A Universe Revealed. Uh, so thank you all so much for helping us welcome back to the St. Louis area and celebrate this fantastic series. Uh, so notes before we begin. Uh, today's event is only possible because of all of your support. When you support Left Bank Books, your money goes directly into your local economy. Um, so it funds your streets and parks and more. Um, it also helps us support the writers um, of your area and beyond. Uh, so thank you so much for shopping local and joining us tonight. Uh, we also want to extend a welcome to our virtual audience. Uh, thank you so much for being here um, from afar. You'll be able to participate later in the Q&A. Uh, you can leave your question as a comment on YouTube. So thank you for being here as well. Uh, we at Left Bank have a fantastic calendar of events coming your way. Um, of note, on March 9th, we're partnering with St. Louis's Very Asian Foundation for a morning of self-reflection and self-healing, featuring Shannon Lee and her new book, Be Water, My Friend. And on March 11th, U.S. Poet Laureate Ada Limon will be on SAUE's campus with us uh, for a poetry reading and discussion. So uh, check out our full calendar of events on our website, left-bank.com. Uh, we've got something for everybody um, for tonight's event. We are delighted to be joined by Eric von Schroeder. Over the course of his career, he has made documentary films, produced television shows, and worked as a training writer for businesses. He was born and raised in St. Louis and spent most of his life here. The older parts of the city and their echoes of a lost world were always the source of deep fascination to him, and these neighborhoods and streets are always etched deep into his brain. He was inspired to create this series by imagining not only what St. Louis is, but also what it was, all the way back to the time of Cahokia, as well as what it could become. Eric and his wife currently live in California, uh, where they're pursuing their dream to live by the ocean. Kirkus Reviews calls this new book in the series, The Universe Revealed, an enjoyable, gentle fantasy that gives new meaning to the phrase, the spirit of St. Louis. Please join me in welcoming the delightful Eric Armstrong. the owner, and then Shane Mullen, the events coordinator, and Jackie Fredman, who is a uh, yeah, consignment buyer. And they've all been really important and helpful in uh, getting this together. And uh, they've also, but thank you, supported my books from the very beginning. I just can't say how, how thankful I am for that. And I'm also thankful and gratified that all of you are here because, uh, you know, I guess I can only think that somehow my books touched you, and that really means a lot to me. Um, and I, again, thank you all for coming. Um, okay, about eight or nine years ago, I had an idea. And immediately, my inner voice spoke up and said, what a ridiculous thing. Don't you have anything better to do? <laughs> Well, I did not listen, and so here we are. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, so what was that idea? It was that there was an alternate version, another city of St. Louis hiding out near us, right here, and one person had figured out how to go. He thought he was the only one who knew the secret. That concept really is universe less travel. The first one, that was that's basically what, you know, I played that out. That's what happened. And then after uh, that came out, and many of you read it, um, something happened. It was something I read about authors talking about, but I didn't believe it. Characters started talking to me. <laughs> but actually, they talked to each other 
but they allowed me to stay in the room. <laughs> and I heard all this stuff. And then events and whole scenes and situations and places started emerging from the mist, usually pretty fully formed. And that's how I got to book two, a universe disrupted, and now to book three. It really came for me. And these visitations would come in two common times. While I was out riding my bike, or at four in the morning. <laughs> that was it. And uh, so, you know, and so that's how, that's how we're, that's why we're here. And now the heart of all three books is this vision that I somehow got of um, this other St. Louis, H.D. St. Louis. And I was wanting to describe a place that was wonderful, that was fun, that was inspiring, but that was also still, and was fantastic and strange, but it was also still recognizably St. Louis. You know, it was clear that it was St. Louis. It was a place that I wanted to go visit, and uh, like my characters did. And in doing so, I drew upon everything I picked up in almost 70 years that I've lived in St. Louis. Um, and I took all those things, my knowledge of the history of the city, all the places I've lived, roaming around the city and looking at the different neighborhoods, and in particular in the older parts of the city, just being blown away by all these houses and buildings, you know, around here, this neighborhood being a good one, this neighborhood I grew up in, uh, as well as down, you know, to Cherokee and Sular, Mafia Square, all these places that uh, no one will build today, not in a million years, but they're here. And I know every city is probably unique, but that all struck me as very unique. Well, particularly after I traveled to other parts of the country and I saw, well, it's not like this, you know, and we really have that. And so, um, my notes. And then I also had, you know, I drew upon my knowledge of St. Louis history, which is fairly good, not like Chris Gordon's probably, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm not, I know I know something because actually my one skill in life is that I'm good at remembering useless pieces of <laughs> everybody, you know, yeah, people church. should nod their heads. Yeah, right. We're in church. Yeah, you can nod your heads. So, uh, uh, I'm good at that. And I, I love trivia nights. I played a lot. I played some of the week. And we've won occasionally. You know, so I'm yeah, pretty good at this stuff. So I took all of that, these experiences, the places I lived, the people I met, uh, the buildings I saw, threw it all into a blender, pushed the button, and these books came out. <laughs> that's kind of how it happened. Um, and so, you know, that's why HD St. Louis has so many things that we're all familiar with, like bricks. Hey, oh, okay. Sure. Okay. Sure. Cool. I just got this. Go to STL Style. You can get one. Or on um, and, um, you know, uh, Steve Miserini, you know, found his way into the books. And, of course, the secret society of shady, mysterious business people. <laughs> you know, and then places. Brandon Gravoy, Crossroads of the Universe. Uh, Tower Grove Park. Riverfront, and then of course, go again. We'll come back to go again in a minute. Uh, but so, in thinking about city, I'm going to give you a little bit of my view of St. Louis and what I think it's all about the good and the bad. And I sort of told you about some of the good. Art. The thing about St. Louis is back around 1900, time of the World's Fair, right? The high point. The the apogee of the city. Everybody assumed that it was already, it was already was one of the biggest cities in the country and it had grown like wildfires since the Civil War. And they all assumed, oh, well, the new century, it's gonna go further and further and further up. That's what they figured. They didn't, no one asked, no one questioned that. And uh, didn't work out that way. I did pretty good until about the depression, depression hit, I guess, but then it was 
different ball game because we had the World War II. And the city kind of started sliding sideways. And we had, you know, some stagnation and then kind of a downward thing, which I grew up around. I think all, all of us have here. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of a sad thing. But that's what happened. And, uh, you know, so I wanted to present a different kind, a different idea for St. Louis. What if that vision of like, we're just going to get better and better and better. Well, what if that happened? What might it be like? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have fun with that idea. And I wanted to present it not as some kind of treatise or an essay or something on urban development, which I know, you know, I'm not an expert in urban development. I'm not an expert in anything. So, but I wanted to present that. So I presented in ways like in glimpses through the stories through the people and let the readers kind of discover it, the little bits and pieces and it all slowly fitting together. And I, because I thought that was fun. I wanted to make them entertaining stories so you could enjoy the, you know, the weird characters and stuff that happened. And I hope I, you know, that's what I hope I succeeded at, but definitely wanted to be entertaining. But I did have a purpose, which I just <laughs> said. So, and then I also tried to touch upon the things, the reasons behind my uninformed view. But I've been around, I've seen a lot, been here and read papers and talk to people, you know, over the years of what happened. Why, well, what are the three reasons that St. Louis hasn't done well? And I think there's two really big ones. One is, and I'm not saying this is a criticism, I'm sort of. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's it lets, but you got to face facts. One was, I think the civic leaders made horrendous decisions over and over again. Think about it. Hey, I've got an idea. Why don't we bulldoze some neighborhoods and build a big highway, and then downtown we'll tear down some old office buildings and put up uh, parking garages. Then people can live really far away. Get in, go to the ball game, and get out real fast. <laughs> that's our idea of a great city. Great, you know. So that's what happened, you know. Um, and then, of course, the other big issue that's still with us today is, and I hate to say it, racism. You know, it's there, and it's torn this city apart, and it's torn people apart, and it's the reason that so many young people just want to get out of town. I think. You know, and uh, I think that's it. Can, no, are my book's going to do anything about that? No, probably not. A lot of people have tried, a lot of people have failed. But I'm, I'm not going to try. So what I can do, I think I'm trying to do one thing. To tickle your imagination. That maybe it could somehow be different. You know, even if you're right, my, not that my particular vision it's worth anything, but it's fun, you know, and some of it can't be forgotten very well. So uh, I don't have the solutions, but I can do that. And I hopefully I've done that. In these books. That was my intent, you know, and besides having hopefully characters you wouldn't wouldn't want to forget. And then I also look further back in history, about a thousand years to Cahokia which was in its time also a great city of North America and which disappeared. You know, but the, those people called the Mississippians today, they were here longer than our society's been here. And now everybody's pretty much forgotten them. So I, I added to my blender this idea that, well, what if that could be somehow got turned into a modern Native American city in Cahokia. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? I think so. Uh, I know it's an idea that when it popped out of the blender into my face sitting at my desk many years ago, I, I thought, that is, that is something that you, once you've thought about it, you can't forget. So I hope you think that too about it. But so that's the other part that I've tried to weave into these stories. And when we get to the third book, it's actually a really main, major part of the of the storyline of what's going on in the third book. So so that's it. So that's kind of my background on what this is all about.
Now, let's talk about book three, Universe for Me. I'm going to start by reading you the opening chapter. Can everybody hear me? A? Okay. The opening chapter, which is super short, on two pages. Um, and in and some of you have read this. Because of course, I did have it out in the novella last year for a little bit, which is sort of my preview, but now it's part of this book. And there's a good reason why it is. Um, I'm not just trying to get out of having to write something. Uh, but reading this first chapter in this room, right here, is this really meta experience. Okay, here we go. Find it here, we'll get started. The chapter is called The Bookstore. <laughs> the turnout wasn't bad. On a foggy evening in June 2012, 20 people crowded into the small San Francisco book bookstore to hear Carol Bustani read from her alternate history novel, Dispatches from an Imaginary World. She had done five of these events, and this was the first one on the West Coast. She and Billy decided to make a trip out of it. They planned to see a Giants game, spend a few days in the wine country before returning home to St. Louis. While she was reading, Billy was checking out a nearby record store for LPs by obscure 1980s bands. He had attended all of her previous events, so he could skip this one. They would meet for dinner. And with the opening sentences of the book, this is the story of a world that doesn't exist, but maybe once did. A world where the barrier between reality and imagination is thin and permeable, where you can wake up on one side of that barrier and fall asleep on the other. Sorry, I've lost here. Okay. She read excerpts from different parts of the book, stories of a fictional city in a fanciful 20th century. There were heroes and villains, disasters and celebrations, beauty and deceit. The small audience applauded when she finished. One woman stood up and said, When I close my eyes, I can see the places in your book, like they're real. I would give anything to go there. Carol chuckled. Thank you very much. So would I. She sat at a small table beside books. A handsome older man with bright blue eyes stood in the line. And when he handed his book to Carol, she asked, who should I make it out to? Jim Collins. He paused while she wrote, I've waited years for something like your book to come along. Oh, that's quite a compliment. Thank you. I especially like your character, George Adrian Matthews. Oh, he's one of my favorites too. He reminded me of my father. That's interesting. My father's name was James Woodamore. <laughs> the color drained out of her face. Uh, um, uh, the book comes from my weird imagination. It's just fiction, nothing more. Really? I would greatly appreciate it if we could talk. Uh, uh, not now, she gestured to the line of the people behind him. He handed her a slip of paper. Here's my number. Call me. So that's sense in motion. <laughs> All, all of book three, everything that's going on. Everybody know who James Elmore Hines is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> uh, that saved me something. So, book three really involves three kind of storylines that kind of intersect over and over. First, the struggle of this guy, Jim Collins, a new character, to understand the mystery of his father. Two, the ongoing quest of Diami Redhawk, right, this guy, uh, to, uh, who's the young man from HD Cahokia to build this new Cahokia that he's desperate, he really feels he's on a mission to build here in our world. And then three, the challenges posed by some other people in our world who have learned the secret of HD and who is Motives are not very nice. <laughs> That's how that, so I'm sure giving you the preview of the book. 
so I'm going to start. I'm going to read a little bit of passage, a little a passage about each one of those three threads. It'll be your turn. So the first one is James Fillmore Hines. And brief recap, uh, in book one, he's this brilliant young stockbroker, 1929. The crash comes. He makes He wakes up in this hospital, in this place where no one knows who he is. No one's heard of the crash. No one knows anything about him or anything that he can figure out. You know? And he goes, Oh, I can struggle. You know, with going to sleep. And he does. He's in HD. He doesn't know what he is. And within a couple of years, and all of this is in the first book. You know, he, he rises up with his brilliance to become the most power the most famous and powerful person in the city. And he sets the city on the path that makes it be this continual growth and all the things I've been talking about. So in the story, he's the one who kind of gets that going. But now we're here in the third book. He left someone behind. His fiance, Daisy Flower. You know, who will found out one day that, hey, he's gone. The love of her life disappeared without a trace. Nobody knows anything. And she's bereft and spends a lot of time trying to figure out what happened. But for a while, she's never again. So she moves on. She moves to Chicago, meets a guy, gets married, has a couple kids. And then, years later, gets a phone call. It's Jim. And she is so angry. Where the hell have you been? You know, you never, what happened? He said, well, I'll tell you. And he tells her this story. And she doesn't believe a word of it. You know, this, come on, give me a break. And then he says, well, I'll take you there and you can see for yourself. So against all of her better judgment, you know, she's married, two kids, all this stuff. She goes, oh, okay. You know, so she, so she goes for two days. She saw for two days. So in the, they're in, so they go to HD. And one of the things he has to do is there's a, 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 a grand opening of this new hotel. And he has to, he has to be there because he needs to finish your big shot. He's obligated to go. So he says, we're going to go do that. She goes, okay. So that's what I'm going to read to you. Jim and Daisy at the ball. So, Jim, wearing a tuxedo with tails, waited for Daisy at the bottom of the staircase. When she appeared on the landing in her blue ball gown, he made a theatrical bow. You look stunning. Tongues will be wagging all over town tonight. She was a little embarrassed. Did a 40-year-old mother deserve this attention? Searchlights swept the sky as Jim's limousine approached the Merriweather Hotel. Well, I'm look at the clock. Oh, okay. no, just taking okay. pictures. Uh, Merriweather Hotel, a tall wedding cake of cantilevered slabs which rose above a white spiral base that covered an entire block. Welcome to another, another of Wright's monuments to himself, Jim said to Daisy, as they emerged from the car to popping flashbulbs for news photographers. They walked along a red carpet as well wishers cheered from behind velvet ropes. Inside, Guests in formal attire marveled at the spacious lobby, which glittered with light. A forest of thin columns went up and spread out at the ceiling. The blue turned into broad circular blooms at the ceiling. Jim plucked a campaign glass, champagne glass from a passing waiter and handed one to Daisy. As a line of guests approached to greet him, he introduced her over and over as Miss Flowers, my dearest friend. A clutch of women looked Daisy up and down with barely concealed envy while they exchanged pleasantries with Jim. After they departed, Jim whispered into Daisy's ear, they'll be a tizzy for days, wondering who the hell is Hines' mystery woman. His eyes sparkled as he grinned. A voiceover a loudspeaker announced that it was time for dinner in the upper ballroom. Guests stood waiting at banks of elevators. 
A short man with billowy white hair tapped Jim on the shoulder. Oh, you and your guests must join me in my private elevator. Jim introduced him to Daisy. This is F.L. Wright who dreamed up this place. The man made a courtly brow, bow and kissed Daisy's hand. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Miss Flowers. Please call me Frank. <laughs> the private elevator whisked them to the top floor of the hotel ahead of the other guests. And Daisy was seated between Jim and Wright at the center of the head table. Wright talked incessantly about his projects and his business, the Hydraulic Brick Corporation. Come on, Frank, give Daisy a break, Jim said. She's my guest after all. Wright turned his attention to the woman who was sitting on his other side. Sorry about him, he never shuts up. Uh, Jim said under his breath, I hope you're enjoying yourself. Oh yes, it's wonderful. Uh, I have to give a little speech after dinner. Daisy was alarmed. Oh my God, you should have been practicing instead of driving me around all afternoon. Jim chuckled, no worries, I can do this in my sleep. So after dinner, the master of ceremonies introduced Jim. There was a standing ovation as he made his way to the podium. Daisy noticed that the crowd consisted mostly of successful, well-groomed men and women in brightly colored gowns who looked like tropical birds. They all gazed in admiration as Jim waved to them. This place really is Oz, Daisy thought, and my Jim is the wizard. <laughs> Jim began by praising the new hotel and its creator, F.L. Wright. The mind boggles at the magnificence we see tonight. This hotel will be the brightest jewel in the crown of our city. But I know that Mr. Wright has even greater things up his sleeve. He nodded to Wright. We eagerly await. The nations of the world await their next marvels. Wright waved the crowd. Jim continued. St. Louis is fast earning a reputation as the city of inventors. From empiric bricks to zip clothing fasteners to new food processes, we are showing the world what a city that works for everyone can do. But still, there are naysayers, but not for long. Tonight, I am pleased to announce that within one year, we will unveil a new invention that will astound the world and propel us to even greater heights of prosperity. I guarantee it. The room erupted in cheers. The wizard had spoken. <laughs> People at the head table shook Jim's hand and clapped him on the back as he returned to his seat. Daisy leaned over and asked him to tell her about the new invention he was promising. Jim said, can you keep a secret? She nodded yes. He whispered in her ear, ear, I haven't the faintest idea. <laughs> <laughs> she opened her eyes wide in surprise. But you promised it within a year. Something will turn up. You know, I believe in the old saying, it's better to be lucky than smart. But do you know it's even better to be both lucky and smart? And I am. He looked her in the eyes with a smile of the brash 29-year-old he was the day they met. He hadn't changed one bit. Daisy's heart melted. There was no one in the world like you. <laughs> he always was. First book. And all he wasn't really in the second book much, but he prominent in the first part of this one. But he's really fine. Okay. So uh, the next thread of the story is Diami and this project to uh, build a new home. Yeah. Well, in book two, he was having a really hard time, if you recall. You know, he couldn't get anybody excited about it. He couldn't make it. He went to reservations. Nobody would you know kind of went, huh? What are you talking about? And part of the problem was Diami's an engineer. Kind of a, very shy. He is not cut out to be a salesman or a messiah, which is kind of what's called for in this case. So he wasn't doing very well. But at the end, until he got some help from some kind of unusual places, which many of you may remember. And one of them was at the end of the second book, he was given a gift. 
And the gift was from some of his friends. All the plans for the bricks, the hydraulic brick corporations, electricity generating bricks, which had transformed the HD world. It was the main source of power everywhere. And it made part of what made St. Louis, you know, sort of like, so I think it was sort of a cross between the French Quarter and Silicon Valley, you know. <laughs> uh, but they had done that. Wright was in charge of that. He had done that. So, but they gave it to him sort of on the slide. And he, they figured, well, you can go to SD, your world, make, make this stuff, and design it, and make it, sell it. Nobody over here will know the difference, you know? And it was sort of like, no harm, no foul. And that was going to get him the money to build a new Cahokia. So he went for it. So, and in doing all this, his partner, <coughs> well, business partner and romantic partner, is Meredith Bustani. The daughter of Billy and Carol. We're going back to the first book. So I'm going to read a little bit about when they first show up in this book. This, this chapter, I'm going to read part of it. It's called The Next Big Thing. Inside a darkened television studio, a production crew was shooting a promotional video. Lights were pointed at Diami in front of the green screen, and Meredith was guiding the shoot, standing next to the hired director. Diami was stiff and awkward <coughs> as he read his lines from the teleprompter. Over and over, he flubbed the tagline. Clean energy, everywhere, all the time. That's the revolutionary product of Morningstar Brick. And time was running out. Meredith and Diami had to get to a meeting soon. On the next take, Diami stopped in mid-sentence and said, this is all wrong, he protested. We can fix it in post, the director whispered to Meredith. Take five while I talk to him, she said. The director announced a break, and Meredith huddled with Diami on the set. I hate these words they wrote for me, he complained. Who approved them? We did, Diami. Well, maybe they look good on paper, but I can't say them. I won't say them. We're building the brand. We want people to like you, so they'll like the company. But technology is what's important, not whether or not they like me. That's not how it works. Well, that's how it ought to work. All I ask is that you relax and have fun with us. It'll never be fun. Diami held up his hand for silence and closed his eyes to think. Meredith frowned. He was stubborn whenever he felt he was being pulled away from the right path, his idea of the right path. She didn't know if a problem was his logical engineer's mentality, his shyness, or, as he often insisted, a Native American cultural style. Probably a blend of all three. She thought back to her grandfather's TV commercials. The Duke of Discounts built his entire business on zany, idiotic performances that, <laughs> according to her father, Billy, were nothing like his real-life personality. Each commercial was shot quickly. The Duke was paying for everything and was notoriously cheap. He, he told directors, whatever take was the worst, use that one. <laughs> he didn't want anything that looked professional to interfere with his image as a lovable, bumbling goofball. If only Diana could take the risk of looking foolish on camera. That might allow, allow a moment of magic to come through. She put his hand, her hands on his shoulders. Say it any way you want. Forget about the lights. Forget about the teleprompter. Forget about the weight of Cahokia and all Native Americans on your back. They touched their foreheads together and gazed into each other's eyes. Meredith wanted to lose him up, loosen him up. She sneaked a gentle poke in his ribs to get him to laugh. Those little moments of mischief never put it. I'm ready now, he said. Diami returned to his mark on the stage. He asked a production assistant to hand him a brick. It was stamped with a Morningstar brick logo and wires protruded from each end. Meredith told the technician to turn the teleprompter off. She blew a kiss to Diami. The director called action. Diami held up the brick in front of him. Everyone wants me to tell you that Morningstar bricks are revolutionary, but they're not. They're ancient. Hundreds of years ago, my ancestors believed there were three worlds. The above world of sun and stars. 
the below world of earth and water, and the middle world where people lived. Our task was to balance the forces of the other two worlds, and that wisdom created this brick. It is fashioned from the materials of the earth, clay, water, and metals, and configured to receive the forces of the sky, day and night, heat, and uh, sorry, the day and night, warmth and cold. Each brick gives birth to a tiny trickle of electricity. Multiplied by thousands, millions, and someday billions, those trickles can build a healthy, beautiful future for our children. He smiles. Walk with us on the sacred path of Morning Star Brick. The director yelled, Cut! and gave Meredith the thumbs up. The crew members applauded, and Meredith ran to Diami and left into his arms. So, that's a little bit of what's going on here. Yeah. Okay. Almost done here, folks. Oh, yeah, we're good. Thread number three, the bad guys, who have found out things that we wish they hadn't found out. But they have. And what are they going to do with it? So this one is a chapter called the beginning of a chapter. I'm going to read very short. I'm just going to read one page. Otherwise, it's fun and complicated. This is called <laughs> Looking Glass. At the other, at the end of another long but fruitful day, Ralph Pellegrini put his feet up on his desk, lit a cigar, and turned on the air purifier to its maximum setting. Even though he was the second highest ranking person in the agency, the only place in the building where he could smoke without setting off an alarm and incurring the displeasure <coughs> of human resources was behind the closed door of his office. He savored his cigar and his brief moment of quiet on the six-month anniversary of the Looking Glass, which had swiftly become his career-defining operation. It began with sending Delgado and Renitsky on an exploratory mission to assess the situation and size up the Knights of the Carnival. Before long, five officers and contractors were working in the other world, then 10, and now 20. They were building a citywide surveillance system with facial recognition, something the Knights wanted desperately. Ralph had bigger ambitions. If everything went according to his plan, there would soon be hundreds of CIA people in this other world. And power would begin to shift to him. So, watch out. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's your preview of... Uh, We're on time, right? Yeah. Good. Great. Yeah. Uh, it's your turn. I'm happy and would love to answer any question anybody has. Don't be shy. <laughs> we got anything on YouTube? I'll keep an eye out. Not yet. I did. Okay. I'm shy too. Yeah, Leslie. So where do you go from here? Well, <laughs> that's this book ends the trilogy. <coughs> I'm not going to do any more books oh. in this book. Well, I'll tell you why. One, first rule of show business, always leave them wanting more. <laughs> and I've seen too many series, both books and then TV shows, where they just kind of, they got a good thing, but they're kind of grasping at straws, you know, in the later seasons. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to put a in my head. But I, I think it's good. And I think, I'll be curious to hear what all of you think. I think that, there are no cliffhangers at the end of this book. <laughs> so I sort of painted myself into a corner. But I think it, I'm really happy with the way it wraps up. I think it's kind of cool. It's got kind of a cool in it. So I hope you think so. I thought so. Yeah. We have, I mean, Sorry. obviously, since you have quite a background in media, I don't know how this would work, but it seems to me like it would be a perfect series. Oh, yeah. yeah. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I mean, I just thought it would be something. It would you be. thought about ways you could I don't that, really so. know how to do that. I've had some people check it out. Steve Smith helped me a little bit with that. We haven't really broken through. We try. you got to remember, 
for every TV series that's made. Probably about 50,000 books are published in San Diego. Yeah. Fiction books. But some series like it's TV or TV. I agree. <laughs> I'm good. Other people, Amanda said the same thing this morning. Other people have said the same thing to me. I thought I thought that too. But, you know, it's hard to not rip through. I do have a friend in LA who's kind of on the fringes of the business, and he's become a big fan. So we'll see. I don't know. I'm not holding my breath. If I, if anyone knows how to make it happen, please let me know. I was thinking about it with St. Louis actors, right? Of course, my idea of who actors and what they look like is kind of 20 years out of date. But think of John Hamm 20 years ago. There's Jim Hines. You know, he's perfect. Uh, another character that many of you may remember pretty much in the first book, and in the second book, only very slightly in this book, is that John Little. Mm -hmm. The TV repairman who works in the back room of the group of discounts. Sterling K. Brown. I know you say this. Yeah, he's perfect. So, I don't know. We'll see. I hope so. It would be really fun. If something... Oh, I'll tell you one other one. And this one, this guy's young. Who's seen the show Reservation Dogs? About the Indian teenagers yeah. in Oklahoma. One of my all time favorite shows. Awesome. And again, they quit after three seasons. Which kind of, yeah. I, I noticed <laughs> that. They could have, I mean, the, the network wanted them to keep anymore, but the guy said no. You remember the character, the young guy, Bear? Bear? Yeah. The handsome young guy? Yeah. He's young, so maybe there's so him. That's Diane. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a great so, Diane. Yeah, that would be a great Diane. Uh, so, okay. We'll see. We'll all go to the premiere. <laughs> yeah. have, you, have you marketed this through the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation? I have not. That's a good idea. Yes. I'm hoping to send it to, I mean, I don't know, because you know, I kind of make fun of Frank Lloyd Wright, so they may not go for that. <laughs> no, he's well, we got got foil. Everybody that loves him makes he, fun of him. He's the foil to Heinz, you know, who thinks he's a pompous blowhard, which he was kind of. That's all I know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, I am going to send it. I haven't gotten around to this. Uh, I first really got, well, I learned about Cahokia because many years ago, I, and my kids went to Whiteout Middle School and you had, and they had a spring break dawn at Woodhenge on the fall solstice to watch the sunrise up. And I went there a couple times, different kids, cold as hell every time. <laughs> but so I did that. But also, I've been going to Cahokia a lot and I was always fascinated with it. I love the museum that they have there. Which they're supposedly redoing. It's been closed for a long time. So I'll see. Anyhow, two other things really blew my mind and got me interested. One, if you, some of you may remember, remember about 2005, there was an exhibit at the Art Museum about the Mississippian culture all across the Southwest. It was called Hero Hawk, an Open Hand. I remember going to that and went, man, what a sophisticated culture and beautiful stuff and really beautiful stuff in me and it's all forgotten um, and so i read later read a book by a guy who's one of the premier experts on uh, Cahokia named timothy Pawkatat, who's written several books about him he's at the university of illinois and one i read the sort of one that's sort of a general audience so i'm thinking of sending it to him because actually in book three i have a character bait in one scene I just call him the archaeologist. Mm -hmm. Sort of based on what I imagine this guy would be like. So I thought it would be fun to say. <laughs> so, but you know, I don't. You know, I all I'm open to all ideas about you know where to market it. Chris, maybe you can help me with some of that. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you yes, Joe. Okay. Your your <laughs> your readers, your audience. Yeah. What are they comprised of? Are they primarily St. Louisans? Or are you uh, getting, getting kind of interest out? Yeah, I am. Uh, well, first off. Yes, I mean, initially, you know, obviously I sold more books than anyone here than any one single place, but I sold a lot of books a lot of places, and I hate to say it, Evan, but, you know, I sell a lot of books on Amazon, you know, <laughs> and Amazon will not tell you where they're from, so I have no idea where those people are from. Last year, I started advertising on Facebook, you know, driving people to Amazon. Over the course of, uh, I sold about 1,000 copies. You know, pretty much all Kindle copies, that's what people buy. They're 90% Kindle. Five or six percent audiobooks and two or three percent paperbacks. So it's a whole different market. But again, other than people who like my page on Facebook, my universalized travel page, 
And I can you know, see who they are, and sometimes it says where they're from, and they're from all over. And the people who contact me are, you know. So I, I think right now I've been doing that. I've sold probably a lot of things everywhere. And I get, I've gotten really nice letters from people in Virginia, California, Wisconsin, I mean, people who never set foot in uh, St. Louis. And of course, many of you have seen, but my website, I try to, you know, I've got a photo gallery of all the places in the world, you know, which is really helpful. Not most of you don't need it, but it's helpful. It's helpful to people who haven't, you know, have never seen this stuff. So, uh, so that's it. Okay, Amanda. Do you feel a responsibility to be an ambassador for St. Louis? I would if I could. Somebody <laughs> wanted me. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, you know, because I'm sort of making my St. Louis is all made up. Right. You know, so I don't know. I mean, I would think I should be on some panels with Scott. Talking like I stuck you all my deep thoughts on urban development, and the city and stuff. But, I would like to know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll do it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Have you had any response from Native American yes. readers? I have not. Because that, I love the idea of the Cahokia or mode of somebody yeah. got that in the brain and started nudging. Yeah, I'm afraid. I'm always nervous that they would think, well, who the hell are you? You know, and, but and I'm sort of just sort of like wrong somehow for a white guy. To, like this stuff. Well, I think it's respectful and it's integrated into the story. I just think it's a great idea. Well, yeah, I think I tried to, and I tried to, I did a lot of research and I did try to integrate in the story nicely, you know, and I'm very, you know, they're the good guys in this story uh, as it unfolds. But uh, no, I have not. If I knew someone to talk to, others, Gene, who said I thought I should do that, uh, you know, I remember, but I don't, don't really know where to begin it. At this point, I just went, oh, hell, I'm right where I wrote. Hey, it's an altered universe. No, <laughs> Katie, did you have your hand up? Oh, I was I was waving at her. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> you have a question. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, Phoebe. This is kind of piggybacking on Leslie's question earlier, which is what's next? Um, yeah. And I know you finished this trilogy. You're leaving it at just three books. Yes. But do you have any idea, any other ideas percolating or any other stories? I have one time? story I'm kind of kicking around. But I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was That's why I had one story that I thought would be fun, but it would be a totally different book. I'll tell you one thing about it. I want to, I began by me thinking, I want to write a story with a first person narrator or a character is telling you the story. And of course, it's trying to convince you of things and trying to hide other things from you, from the reader. I thought that would be a lot of fun. It would be different from this. But it's, I've got, I've got a kind of a concept, but. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. I had to get through this first. You know, but I've written like 50 pages, 60 pages in my notebook of ideas related to this idea. So I'm kind of playing around with it. So, but it's too soon to say anything. Okay. Well, all right. We're done. Thank you. <laughs>